Um, thank you everyone for joining us here today. Uh, we are the Sustainable Economic Development Task Force of Indiana County, joined with the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Um, and uh, I will begin my screen share. While we wait for more people to join our, our webinar, um, I'll just give some fun, not fun facts, but a quick review of what the Sustainable Economic Development Task Force is and a bit about, about our history. We were started um, back in April 2017, um, whenever the Indiana County Commissioners held the first Sustainable Economy Summit. The commissioners at the time were Shereen Hess, Rod Ruddick, and Michael Baker. Starting in, two, uh, in September of 2017, uh, the task force began working on a report to uh, try and find um, opportunities for sustainable economic development within the county. Through this process, they identified four key focuses for the county, um, being in sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, building construction materials, and environmental restoration and stewardship. Within these four focus groups, uh, the report focuses on opportunities that would um, allow for economic development, workforce development, and citizen education. To create the report, we engaged the community. There were lots of workshops um, and, and uh, opportunities for people to share their ideas and concerns for the county. They identified, um, in addition to uh, actions are in, in recommendations related to the four focuses. They also uh, identified five executive uh, recommendations, one being to create a new mission for the task force uh, and uh, identify a purpose for it moving forward, um, to develop an office of sustainability. So far, we don't have an office of sustainability, but I serve as the sustainability coordinator to the task force in my position as a senior land use planner um, for the Indiana County of Office. Uh, Office of Planning and Development. Uh, they wanted to continue holding annual, uh, uh, sus <laughs> annual sustainability economic summits, and they wanted to incorporate sustainability into long-range plans in the community. And finally, they identified the need for broad, uh, more broadband access in Indiana County, which I think is very relevant to, uh, you know, our, our current situation here in 2021. Then uh, in September of 2018, they um, uh, revealed this report to the public and it was adopted by the county commissioners. Since then, we held a, another summit, Summit 3 in 2019. Um, unfortunately, we were not able to hold a summit in uh, the fall of 2020 due to the global pandemic. Um, but, you know, to serve as kind of a, uh, you know, a, to try and keep things going, we decided to have this webinar series. So this serves as our Summit 4. We've had um, a lot of um, opportunities for uh, sustainability across the county and a lot of partnerships that have um, been developed throughout this process of holding summits, um, sharing ideas, making new partners. Um, if anyone is interested in getting more involved with the task force or wants to learn more about us, they can check out our, our website, sustainableindianacounty.org. All of the recordings of all of our webinars are available at sustainableindianacounty.org. You can also contact our organization at sustainableindianacounty at gmail.com. So with all that being said, almost five minutes into the presentation, I will give the floor to Bonnie McGill from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Thanks, Molly. Yeah. Let me turn my slides on here. Are you able to see that? Oh, yeah. And actually, before I forget, I just wanted to mention, um, if you could all stay tuned at the end of the webinar, um, when we shut down the webinar, it'll automatically put you into a survey to let us know, you know whether or not you enjoyed this presentation, if there's anything we can be doing better as a task force, and whether topics you'd like to hear. So thank you. Great. That'll be helpful to us as well. Um, so today we're going to be talking about Keystone State wildlife in a changing climate and what we can do about it. And we are a, a team of folks from Pittsburgh. Um, so I'm Bonnie McGill. I work at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. 
Um, but I'm joining you today from Indiana, PA, from, from, from my mom's place. And to show that I'm authentically from Indiana, I have included a photo of me from high school at Marion Center. <laughs> We also have with us on the call, if you want to give us a wave, we have Dr. Marianne Steiner. She is with the University of Pittsburgh Center for Learning in Out-of-School Environments. We have Lauren Horner. She's an environmental educator at Powder Mill Nature Reserve. You want to give us a wave and we're going to talk more about Powder Mill. And Taiji Nelson, also with me at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. He is the project manager for the Climate and Rural Systems Partnership. And I am going to uh, hand it over to Taiji. Yeah, so thank you everybody for joining us today um, for a topic we hope you think is interesting. Uh, we also know that it's a complicated topic, so we are glad that you all um, decided to turn out uh, to figure out how we can talk about climate change and make it locally relevant. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do uh, was ask you to pause and think for a minute. Oh, we are recording this. We just like to let people know because, again, people are uncomfortable sometimes about talking about climate change. Uh, our goal at CRISP, the Climate and Rural Systems Partnership, is to make people more comfortable talking about climate change. But we know that some people, it's a hot button issue. Uh, and so we like to let them know that we're recording this meeting. It's being live streamed on Facebook. Um, so we just like to let people know that anything you show up in the comments, uh, in the chat, uh, people will be able to see it, but we really think talking about climate change is important, so that's not meant to scare you off. Uh, so I wanted to take a minute uh, to think about how do you usually react when climate change comes up? So it could be in a conversation you have, it could be in the media, uh, it could be you see a comment or a post scroll through your newsfeed. Um, think about how you react when climate change comes up. And if you could, for folks joining us today over Zoom, uh, if you could drop the number of the owl that's your face when it comes up. Panelists, I invite you to do this too. Yeah, so when climate change comes up in conversation, this is for Janice, uh, when climate change comes up in conversation, uh, looking at these pictures of these seven owls, which do you usually, how do you usually react? I think sometimes it could be uh, you're stunned, you're not sure what to say. Sometimes it could be you're depressed. Sometimes it could be that you're like, I don't know about all that stuff. I think there's a wide range of reactions that when climate change comes up, you might be feeling. Chances are it's more than one of those at one time. At least that's how it is for me. Next slide, Bonnie. Uh, so <laughs> this picture also resonates with me. I feel like sometimes I'm the owl uh, because climate change is a serious topic. Um, it's literally about the end of the world. It's about complicated science. It's about complicated ethics. It's about economics and policy and justice. Um, so it's a complicated topic. Sometimes I feel like the owl in this picture, uh, but also sometimes I feel like the person holding the hose. I feel like I have, I care a lot. I want to talk about it. And I feel like sometimes I'm blasting people with all of that, all of my emotion and my understanding and my feelings about it. Um, so it's a, it's a complicated thing to talk about. Um, but I'm going to draw on some James Baldwin, uh, one of my personal heroes. Uh, and he says that not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Yes, climate change is a complicated topic. The solutions are gonna look different for every person in every community. Um, and usually they're very deeply tied to our, our core beings, what we care about, how we survive. Um, but that shouldn't stop us from talking about it. If we're gonna do something about it, we need to be able to talk about it. So now what? Thank you, James, uh, but what do we do? So I wanted to pause again and ask you all to think. Um, I find, I'm a, I'm, my background's in environmental education, and I find that most people have a bird story in their life, uh, a story that involves a bird somehow. It could be funny, it could be really meaningful, it could be scary, um, but most people have a bird story. 
So take a minute, think for yourself, do you have a bird story? Uh, so animals that we're connected to uh, when it comes to talking about climate change, one of the educators we work with really closely up in Mercer County at the Mercer County Conservation District talks a lot about ambassador species. Uh, so these organisms that we really connect to. Um, I know in my experience, lots of people connect to birds. Uh, when it comes to talking about climate change though, people often talk about far away things. They talk about climate change as an issue that's far away in time or far away in space. So the polar bear is a good example of an ambassador species. People rallied around a polar bear uh, to say climate change is a problem. It's impacting an animal we care about. We should do something. We need to recognize what humans are doing to cause this problem. Um, but what we found is that a polar bear is pretty limited in its scope. Uh, it's really effective for some people to drive action on climate change, um, but we know it seems so far away that it's not really necessarily relevant to as many people. Um, next slide, Bonnie. So we're saying maybe we can use birds. Uh, birds, they're charismatic, they're beautiful, and they are directly tied to places that we as humans love. Um, so Birds are what we are thinking is a really good ambassador species that we're experimenting in our network to figure out how can we tell compelling climate stories about things people can see in their backyards. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Lauren, a educator at Powder Mill Nature Reserve to talk about some of the stories um, that connect birds to place and human impacts uh, in our region. Thanks, Taiji. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, Bonnie. So as Taiji said, there are some amazing stories in your backyard, in our backyard, and you had a moment to kind of think about your bird story and a couple people are sharing, and that is really great. So I want to talk about some of the bird stories from Powder Mill Nature Reserve. And you can see on this slide here, there is a picture of a bilateral genandromorph rose-breasted grosbeak. So if we break that down for a second, bilateral meaning split in half, essentially. Genandromorph, G-Y-N for female, andro for male. This bird is half male and half female. So bilateral genandromorph. And if you look at the bird on its right wing, you can see this rose color. And the right half of its breast is also starting to get some of that rose color. On the left side, you see kind of a yellowish orange, it's a really pretty color. That is the female side. That's the female underwing color of the rose-breasted grosbeak. This occasionally happens. And so this bilateral genandromorph, thank you, Taiji, for putting that in the chat, was caught at Powder Mill Nature Reserve. And it generated a lot of attention. It was picked up by National Geographic. It was seen all over the world. We know of someone in Indonesia who was talking about it. And I have also on this slide a map showing where Powder Mill Nature Reserve is. So that little teeny red pin on the bottom right, that's Powder Mill Nature Reserve. Indiana County is just north of that. And for reference, Pittsburgh is over there on the west. So of course we put this on the Powder Mill Facebook page and we got a ton of response. Uh, 1.7 million people were reached by this single post. Over 9,000 people reacted to it in some way. I don't have the stats on here, but lots and lots of shares as well. So right in your backyard, this individual bird could have come to your bird feeder even. Let's bounce on to another story for, of birds at Powder Mill. So now I wanna talk a little bit about bird eruption. So when we talk about a bird eruption, that means that birds are migrating, certain species anyway, are mig migrating differently than they normally would. More specifically, I have a picture of a red-breasted nuthatch here because that is one of the bird species that we saw in great abundance at Powder Mill Nature Reserve this winter due to an eruption. So, that happens when there's a shortage or an abundance of food and the birds are following the food. 
usually it's a shortage of food. And in the case of the red-breasted nuthatch, they eat the seeds of conifers. So a nice wet, soggy spring led to a decrease in production of cones and seeds that the nut hatches would eat in their normal wintering grounds, which are considerably further north than Powder Mill Nature Reserve. And so they came further south looking for those seeds and we were able to net many more birds, many more uh, red-breasted nut hatches this year. It's somewhat cyclical based on the food and we can kind of predict it and community science efforts help us predict these things Things like feeder watch and the Christmas bird count really play a big role because we are able to say in this year when we looked at these conditions across the entire year we saw more red-breasted nut hatches so then the next time we get a spring that's similar we can say I thought we're going to get a lot of red-breasted nut hatches because we're going to have an eruption year so the last thing that's on this slide is not about eruption but I want to just take a quick peek at it. Bonnie, if you're able to open that for us to see. So I want you to watch this and see what you think is happening here. And if you're joining us via Zoom and you want to put a guess in the chat, go ahead. If not, just give it a, a second thought. It's on a loop, so it'll, it'll come around one more time before I say. So what we're actually seeing here is birds taking off in the middle of the night. Birds migrate at night. So this is, these are radars across the United States and you see these little donuts kind of exploding and each of those little donuts is centered around a radar tower and you can see the birds taking off. So we'll use something like this to say, oh, a whole lot of birds took off. That means that today is going to be a big day for us for birds. Yes, so somebody commented in the chat that it starts on the east and kind of spreads to the west with the with the time. It's just a really cool image and if you are interested in seeing more data from different days you can just google birding by radar and look for NEXRAD and that will come up for you. So we've talked a, a good bit about a couple different stories from Powder Mill Nature Reserve bird stories and I am now going to pass it off to Bonnie to talk about more specific bird information. Great. <clears throat> yeah, I love seeing that as the sun rises east to west, you see the, the birds taking off. So now, get this working. Um, we're going to look, do a little section here on signs of climate change in migratory songbirds in where we are, the Laurel Highlands of Pennsylvania, and really thinking like how can local migratory songbirds tell us about climate change? And we're going to use the wood thrush as our teacher today. And here we go, we're going to listen to its song. So maybe that's a sound that you're familiar um, with hearing, um, that they hang out in deciduous forests of the eastern U.S. in the summer. They're kind of a reclusive bird, um, and they have pretty good camouflage, as you can see. And in my memory, when I think of a, seeing a wood thrush, it's usually scrabbling, scrambling around in the leaf litter, and they like pick up a dead leaf to see what like insects it reveals so that it can eat some insects. Um, they're still um, pretty numerous, but it's, it has some rapidly declining numbers, um, possibly in part to cowbird nest parasitism at the edges of fragmenting habitat and to acid rains depletion of um, some of its uh, invertebrate prey. So um, its numbers are declining due to these and, and other challenges. And in fact, we've lost one in four birds in North America since 1970. Um, and I'm going to put a link in the chat. You can learn more about that at 3billionbirds.org. 
Um, and so on top of these challenges, birds are shifting behaviors to adapt to climate change, which is what we're going to focus on today. But just to kind of put the bigger picture um, into context of what, what the wood thrush and other um, birds in North America are facing. Um, Lauren mentioned the powder mill uh, nature reserve. And while we're on this slide, if there are some birders on the call, feel free to put in the chat your guesses as to the three birds that are on the slide. Um, and so in the spring and fall, Powder Mill Nature Reserve, um, the, their avian research center, which you might hear is called PARC, um, they mist net and capture birds taking measurements six days a week for six hours a day in the spring and fall. So those are kind of those hot times of migration. And in the summer and winter, it's like three to five days a week. And they've been doing it exactly the same way since 1961. So for 60 years, which is really special. Um, they've banded over 600,000 birds and those little tiny bands that you're, you see a little anklet on there gives it a unique ID so they can track when they capture it, how it's doing, how it has changed. If it doesn't have a band, putting a, you know, a new one on so they know it's a new individual in their data set. They've um, measured over 190 different species of birds. And um, some of the data that they collect is they, the sex, the weight, their age, which they can actually tell based on the feathers, um, their spring arrival date, nesting date, um, when they, their young fledge and departure dates, if they're a migratory bird, of course. Um, and so this research story that I'm about to tell you is the work of Luke de Grote and others at Park. I am a scientist, um, but I'm not this kind of scientist. And so my role here is being the science communication fellow on this climate and rural systems partnership, um, which is this group that we're presenting here. So I've illustrated this kind of research story for you today. Um, and I'd like to um, point out that the scientists who started this project in 1961 at Park, they didn't know all the different ways that their data could be used in the future. They were not thinking about how climate change might change when birds arrive and nest and fledge. But if we had only measured, so this is from a paper of Luke's um, here, and, and they're using this long-term data, right? But you can imagine if we had only started measuring these things when we were more thinking about climate change, we would only have this window of the data. And so it would be more statistically, um, we wouldn't be able to say there's actually a trend going down or going up um, here. Um, and so this is an example of why supporting long-term ecological research is important for understanding how nature works um, and humans' impacts on nature and ultimately what we can do to reduce or eliminate those impacts. So the climate is changing, it's happening, um, and it's human caused. Specifically in Westmoreland County, um, the average annual temperatures have increased by two degrees Fahrenheit since 1960. The average springtime temperatures have increased by two to four degrees Fahrenheit. And by 2050, the average annual temperatures are projected to increase another four to five degrees Fahrenheit. But, you know, these like two, four degrees Fahrenheit, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot. What does it mean for the timing of the season? So to you and me, it might not feel like a lot. It would cause a fever, right, if our temperature went up. Um, and so that's what we're going to uh, explore here is looking to nature to see how does two to four degrees of spring warming that's already occurred, how has that changed things? So for every 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperature, plants bud burst three days earlier. Um, and so this is a little, uh, imagine a shag bark hickory leaf bud there. And um, migratory birds need to arrive at this time, this bud burst time, because tree leaves have fewer toxins and insects, especially caterpillars, um, like to take advantage of those fewer toxins in the young leaves. And insects, like caterpillars, are the breakfast of champions for birds. So migratory birds need to arrive early 
to be on time. So arrive early according to our calendar, but in order to be on time according to the food web. And I just can't help myself but saying the early bird literally catches the worm, right? Okay. So, oh, okay. So those are my animations. And many migratory, so the research is showing, showing us that many migratory songbird species are responding to these warmer, earlier springs in two big ways. So back in the 1960s, when the park researchers started collecting data, the average wood thrush arrival date was May 5th, and now it is April 30th. So they're arriving five days earlier. Part of that um, is it's a little tricky to speed that up, right? Because if you're a migratory bird overwintering in Belize, you don't really know what the weather cues are up in Indiana, PA. So you don't really know you need to speed up. Um, and I'll also add that the wood thrush, as you can see in this kind of cartoon map, um, they spend one night flying over the Gulf of Mexico. Amazing, right? Okay, so they're doing that five days earlier. That's one of the things. The second thing that birds are, way birds are adapting is they eat, love, nest in a hurry. So, and they're, so they're actually nesting and breeding 22 days earlier than they were in the 1960s. And so, like I said, why that matters, why they need to do that um, is to, um, Take it, you know, because the other parts of the food web are speeding up in response to that temperature change. So they need to take advantage of that. And if they are able to take advantage of that food on time, then the growing season is kind of longer, their summer season. So they might be able to get a second brood in. Maybe they don't usually do that. So they might have two broods per season. Or if the first one fails, like a snake eats their eggs or something, they have a second shot. And I said that many migratory songbirds are responding this way according to the park data. And so some of those other birds that are doing these two things are your black back, black cap chickadee, the gray catbird, cedar waxwing, common yellowthroat, hooded warbler, American red start, song sparrow, American robin, oven bird. Just so you get the idea that it's uh, not just the wood thrush, but the wood thrush is representative of a whole group of similar birds that are responding similarly. So this is what has happened with the two degrees Fahrenheit of annual temperature change in Westmoreland County since the 1960s. But birds won't always be able to keep pace with climate change. They have a finite capacity to adapt. Um, they do need to come here to breed. Um, they don't breed in their um, winter uh, grounds in Central America. And so they're projected, with a projected four to five degrees annual average temperature change, um, that gets you kind of thinking about like, well, how much further will they be able to just keep adapting? So birds need our help. They already need our help, right? Because of uh, loss of habitat and how the insects are declining. Um, but today I'm going to talk about three actions that we can take as individuals and communities that you might not normally think of as helping birds and wildlife. Um, so the usual things you might think of with helping birds um, and other wildlife might be like planting native plants. Always, that's great. Keeping your cat indoors. Yes, please. Um, but in order to help um, the birds and wildlife face climate change, your actions don't have to be wildlife specific. Um, so conserving habitat is kind of a win-win because um, important bird habitat like grasslands, wetlands, um, forests are also really important places where we can sequester carbon. Um, choosing renewable energy, you might not think that, you know, choosing some wind or solar on your energy bill is, has anything to do with birds, but it actually, it does. And if you're thinking about how, well, don't windmills kill lots of birds? Um, and we know that in the Laurel Highlands, especially in Somerset County, we have a lot of um, wind turbines. 
the Audubon Society, and you can check this out on their webpage, they support wind energy that's properly sited so that it doesn't interfere with um, birds, but that they recognize that this is a necessary step in order to have a planet um, with a climate that these birds can live in. And eating less meat, that's kind of an awkward one to talk about, um, but it can have a huge impact on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. So where's this coming from? What, you know, like who am I to tell you these things? So um, Project Drawdown is um, an organization of academic um, folks, scientists, um, scholars who have said, okay, we have solutions. How much can the solutions have an impact on climate change so that we can start moving toward action and not just, hey, we need to collect more data. So what they're showing, this is a graphic from, from them, and they're showing us the current sources of greenhouse gases that are going into the atmosphere. So it's this kind of like rainbow. And they're showing us by different segments, different economic sectors, where those emissions are coming from. And those end up in the atmosphere. Oops, that's not right. There's some, okay. So those end up in the atmosphere. And then there is, uh, there's another end of the rainbow that comes down and that's um, removing some of those greenhouse gases back into the land into trees, into the ocean. The ocean does a lot of work for us, but there's like this leftover um, chunk that's left in the atmosphere that's beyond the capacity of um, uh, what we call sinks, these storage sites for carbon. So what are the, some of the things that we can do to reduce those emissions going up into the atmosphere, as well as increase those sinks that are pulling the greenhouse gases down into, um, away from the atmosphere? So um, according to the same colors we were using on the, the previous slide, you can see that um, the circle size here, these are according to the drawdown um, scientists, and this is like peer reviewed work, um, the small circle and then it has a bigger lighter colored circle, that's sort of the, the range of impact that we can have. So we can turn things around um, and reduce emissions to this degree, but if we really change things, we can even have this big of an impact. So shifting electricity production is huge. So that's why I was saying um, working on renewable energy. Um, and I recognize we're in Indiana County. We have the Homer City Power Plant. People are probably thinking about what the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative means for a place like Homer City in Indiana County. I totally recognize that. Um, and there are important organizations like Reimagine Appalachia, if Taiji wants to put the link in there and the link to their, um, they have like a leading document that outlines their plans that them and other organizations are working with the state to figure out how to take money from Reggie um, to benefit and in a just way, fairly kind of carry through communities like Homer City um, through a transition away from coal um, energy. So there's a whole other conversation to have there. And we imagine Appalachia is a great place to have that um, conversation. So I just wanted to give respect to that topic that's on people's minds. So choosing renewables, that's why I said that one for helping the birds. Um, the next biggest sector where we can reduce emissions is in food, agriculture, and land use. And the biggest one is actually addressing food waste. So food that is grown um, has a whole, it has a greenhouse gas footprint. And if we grow it and we take it to the store and you take it home and then it doesn't feed anyone, then we've emitted all those greenhouse gases for like nothing. So um, that's an important way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but also having reducing your diet, um, not reducing your diet, but um, having more of a plant-based diet than a meat-based diet. And I don't mean everyone needs to be vegetarian or everyone needs to be vegan. I, I can't be vegan. I'm not going to. Yeah. But, but what I am saying is reducing the amount that you eat and um, supporting local producers is a great idea um, also. So eating less meat, there's also things in other sectors, um, industry, transportation, building, you know, Ford just came out with all their vehicles are going to be um, electric by, is it 2030 or something? Um, 
like that. But that, so that's exciting. Even without government regulation, they're doing that. And then so that's reducing emissions. And then we can increase those sinks, those storage sites for carbon. And what humans can do, what we're capable of, um, a really big one is shifting agricultural practices. Well, I'm not going to get into that today. Um, but if you tune in for, we're going to have another webinar in this series on March 17th. Molly can put it in the chat if, if you want uh, the, the link and everything. Where we are going to talk about some of that. Um, but here today, um, I mentioned in this because we're we can do this conserving and restoring habitats um, to help them lock in more carbon from the atmosphere. So for my section here, um, what I hope some of the takeaways are for you is that the Powder Mill Avian Research Center is a local resource for bird research and education. So yeah, you can contact them now for to see how if you're able to set up a tour and what that would involve in uh, normal times. Once we're all vaccinated and everything is back to normal, they're going to have a brand new facility building too. And you can actually go with them when they're mist netting to capture and ban birds and they can show you their lab where they take measurements. So that's a really cool thing for taking student groups. It's just an hour drive south. Um, we also talked about bird decline. Oh, and I don't know if we said this, but to make it clear, Powder Mill is part of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, just to make that clear. Um, and so we talked a bit about bird decline. You can check out 3billionbirds.org to learn more about that and stuff you can do to help birds. Um, we showed you that local research, the wood thrush, our teachers, it, they're responding to these warmer springs, so it's very real for them. Um, and we just talked about some actions that you and, and the community can take to reduce the severity of climate change which will help birds and wildlife and ourselves. And now I'm going to turn it off, turn it over to the wonderful Dr. Marianne Snyder. So I, we've just heard like this beautiful presentation that went from how do we think about climate change to a charismatic species that we care about, a story, a personal story we remember. And so I'm gonna now sort of unpack the way that these folks designed this webinar so that we can think a little bit about how CRISP, Climate Rural Systems Partnership, is thinking about approaching having these climate change conversations. So the first thing I want to point you to is, um, beep, is the um, Yale Climate Opinion Maps, which is a website that we can share too, where they've done collected survey data across the nation about how people are thinking about climate change at different points in time. And the most recent one says that in Indiana County, 61% of the people believe that climate change is, global warming is happening. Um, and that's compared to 70% in Pennsylvania and 72% nationally. So it's a little bit more conservative maybe than the broader community, but it's more than 50%. It's a majority of people. And, but the thing that where I'm struck is that while the majority believe climate change is happening, only 35% report discussing it at least occasionally. And 25% say that they hear about it maybe weekly in the media. So you've got these people who believe and then these people who aren't, you know, you're just holding it inside, right? So what are the barriers to talking about climate change? And Taji touched on this as well in the beginning. So now beep. <laughs> So there's three big things in social science research, three things that we've been thinking a lot about. One is this sense of overwhelm. The scale of climate change is global. It happens over time periods that are much longer than my attention span, um, even though they're shortening and they're within my lifespan. And the systems are so complex that how do you like begin to wrap your head around it? People can get overwhelmed. Another thing is this sense of futility. I may have changed all my light bulbs, I might be composting, I might ride my bike when I can, but when I watch the news and I see typhoons and fires and it's like, how is anything I'm doing gonna make a difference? And then the third one is based on the um, data I just showed you. If I, if I am in a space where I'm not talking about climate change and I, I'm not talking because I feel like there's social risk, I feel like other people don't believe in it, how do I bridge that gap? How do I get myself into a place where I can be, have some agency around it? So the sense of isolation, and they, some people call it a spiral of silence. 
So one of the things that we do, or some of the things that we do in CRISP is we, just like your group, are thinking in networks. Who are all the different people that we can bring together? How can we involve them in design of ideas and generating ideas and also connecting and learning with other people? We have these principles that we call the CRISP DNA that I'll talk you through in a minute that sort of are the backbone of anything that we do. And we try to use them to design data presentations, to bring expertise together, to design tools that help us bridge, each of us individually bridge what we know to what somebody else knows. So in this example today, we started out with what bird stories do you have? What, what memories of birds? How do you feel about birds? What's the local relevance to you about birds? Then we can go to the next one. And then Bonnie gave us, and, and Lauren as well, but some evidence about what shows us about birds and climate change. How does, how does um, data about seasonal changes, about bird behavior, how do all of that impact the way birds live their lives? And are there any kind of emotions and feelings that that evokes for us? I wonder if you all could take a second and just think about something in that presentation that you remember or that struck you something that you might want to share with somebody else after this and just take a minute and write it and put it in the chat. Could be something you already knew but are thinking about in a different way or connecting to climate change in a different way. Yeah, the So after, so after we thought a little bit about data and what data can show us, um, Bonnie went on to talk about the interconnectedness of the bird's life and our life, right? And that leads us to some ideas about how we can participate in meaningful ways to get over that futility feeling. And then what kinds of interconnections interconnections we can identify between this complex big global thing that we can start to draw a path through some of these ideas and and get a better sense for how we can have some agency and and I, I would have to say that that is like the hardest piece of the puzzle in all of this work that we've done is like getting from one thing that you care about and connecting it back in meaningful ways to these bigger systems so all together our crisp DNA always talks about something that has to do with human caused climate change. It might be how to mitigate, it might be mitigate a cause, it might be how to adapt to uh, impact, it might be a solution for drawdown, like all the drawdown slides that Bonnie shared. Um, and it sometimes includes also co-benefits, things that, you know, when you protect bird habitat, all of a sudden we have more trees and maybe cleaner air or, you know, there's like health impacts, there's social impacts and there's impacts to other critters on the earth. And, life forms. So the, the pieces that I kind of tried to draw through all the examples was this idea of local relevance, that we have to be open to personal feelings, that if we, if we try to have this conversation with a lot out, without allowing people to feel what it's like, then that can be a missed opportunity where people can shut down. And then we want to offer an invitation for people to participate in either thinking about how we're going to talk about it or actually having conversations with each other, doing things connected to it, maybe as a next step after an experience. I wonder, you know, if you think about the options that Bonnie offered us today, are there any of those that you could imagine actually going out and doing next? You know, is there something that you can do tomorrow or today that's going to help birds? And then could you imagine a way 
to invite more people to do that with you. So you have that sense of collective impact a little bit. So, and then the interconnection is like this bigger, the bigger story we're trying to sort of tell stories throughout and then using evidence just to help us. Um, you can say, oh, birds are gonna, you know, their, their flight changes, their, their timing is gonna change. But when you can dig in and start to see the whys and the, the story about the leaves, the young leaves not being as poisonous, so that's when the caterpillars are there. There's like all these little pieces that might get us thinking in new ways about this very complicated topic and help us to make a more compelling story for somebody else to engage with. So my, I think, so yeah, so we have, Lauren shared this, this little poster. I don't know if you've seen it before. You want to take a minute to read it, but the big idea is you're not alone, that we all want to be a we, and we're so excited that you're here at this call and interested in this kind of work um, because there, this is such a complex project. There is not one solution to climate change. And the more people we have thinking and talking about it, the bigger chance that we have to succeed. <laughs> Can we go back? Yep. Thanks, Bonnie. So if you've not had a chance to, to read that one, please take another 30 seconds to read that. I wonder if someone wants to read it in case anyone is having trouble seeing the slides. That sounds great. I can do that. Mm. So we've got this kind of sad looking little green bird all by himself and it says, hey, caring about climate change can be isolating and overwhelming. And we've got three little birds looking depressed and, and it says, most of us are concerned about climate change, but we don't talk about it very often. So everybody thinks that nobody cares. And then we've got more birds and they're starting to pick their heads up a little bit. But you're not alone. You're part of a huge crowd that's working on this problem. And we have solid solutions. In the next, uh, next frame, they're all excited. It's not just you, it's we and we need your voice. So in this case, we're gonna throw out the we as being CRISP, which has been referred to a couple times, the Climate and Rural Systems Partnership. And we would love for you to join us if you are interested. So we have a quick, a super short, short survey that I believe Taiji just put in the chat. Thank you very much. It's, it's five questions, three of which are who are you kind of questions. So if you're interested in learning more about the Climate and Rural Systems Partnership, please fill out that survey and we will get back to you. Uh, we do have meetings. Yes, join us, please. We have meetings to bring people together to talk about climate change and to talk about how to talk about climate change with audience members of your organizations, with other people in your organization and just other people. We can also, um put that link on our website for later access under the section where we have information about this presentation. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. All right, so if we can go to the next slide. Thank you, Bonnie. So I want to know, we want to know mm -hmm. what your big takeaway from today is. So we're gonna do a waterfall if we can. Um, so I want you to take about a minute and type something into the chat. For those of you who are able to join us on Zoom today, type something into the chat, your big takeaway from today's experience, but don't hit enter yet. Okay, I'm gonna count down from three, two, one, and then say go and hit enter. And we'll get sort of a waterfall effect of our responses. Three, two, one, go. Okay. And uh, just for the um, people who are watching on Facebook Live, would you guys mind reading a few of your favorites? Definitely can do that. 
All right, we've got a few coming in. It does make me feel better knowing that there are folks out there such as yourselves who are doing great things. Thank you, that was very kind. So it's good to know that people are talking about this. It's good to know that people are doing things. Specifics about migratory birds and, and leafing out trees were great examples and more examples are wanted. So that's good for us to know too, having more examples of things that we can point to about climate change. And that's something that we work on in the CRISP network too. Stories about people and how they care about things and backed up with and it being backed up with data and that can be useful to communicate about climate change. Talking to, talking to people who can't see is who we can't see is harder than we thought. Thank you guys for being here, even though we can't see you. <laughs> Taking the time to dig into the natural history of organisms gives us gives me clearer and more compelling stories rather than ranting. <laughs> and keep talking about climate change and there are folks really thinking about this. These are great comments. Thank you guys so much. Oh, one more. Recognizing ways to share with the community to help them connect with nature and inform them on ways to benefit themselves, more wildlife, and the planet in a non-aggressive way. That is a beautiful summation. Thank you. <laughs> non-aggressive. Okay. Well, that is our show. <laughs> we want to thank you all for uh, coming and your participation in the chat has been really nice since we can't see you and we know you're following along your interest. We've put our um, contact information there on the slide. Feel free to reach out to us um, and we are happy to take your questions at this time and I'll let Molly take over with with that. Thank you so much guys. This was so much fun. Um, I put a link in the comments also to our sustainable uh, web page where we're going to have a recording of this a video available after you know we, we edit it and make it look nice and clean for the website. Um, we can also add any information that the Carnegie Museum of Natural History would like, uh, including that link of getting involved. And um, if you guys could just hang on for a little bit, uh, we would love it if you could give us some answers on the uh, on the exit survey. If you aren't able to fill it out now, we do have that posted on the website as well. So. Um, and yes, there is there is a 2.30 meeting that um, I, I'm aware of. Um, so if you can go to the website uh, after that meeting and fill out that survey, that would be great. And we definitely want to know how we can do this better. The thing I love about CRISP is it is a group of people who cares about learning. Um, so if there's something that you thought worked really well, something that you thought was like, mm, maybe don't say that, maybe you could frame it differently, ideas, this is like, we totally want to hear from you. Um, it's, uh, that's what I love about this. It's a group of people who really want to learn from and with one another. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions now for us? And if not, come, come online on. and let us see you. <laughs> I don't think with, uh, in this format they can share their camera, unfortunately, but um, we, we can open up uh, if you if you guys raise your hand or anything like that, we should be able to see it and uh, give you the ability to speak if you'd like. Are you kidding? Yeah, he just hit his head. Actually, uh, <laughs> he has this little globe toy um, that he's playing with today. It's part of the theme. How um, how is working for climate change in rural PA going? So that's a great question. And during a pandemic, right? <laughs> so we're trying to build a network during a pandemic. So we've just relied on Zoom and we've been way more successful than any of us thought we could be in April 2020 mm -hmm. with, um, with building connections with people. We found that there, um, you know, as um, Marianne's data showed, there is this like group of uh, our communities that want, that need a place to come and express their concerns or their feelings about climate change or their frustration about not being able to talk about it. And then having a safe space to do that 
finding that there are other people at neighboring similar organizations that are thinking the same way. So you can potentially form partnerships um, and people are doing that in our networks. Um, so one of them is Laurel Highlands region. And another one of our regional hubs is um, up in Mercer County, uh, kind of the Shenango River Valley area. So kind of north of Pittsburgh. Um, and so this first year of the project, we're just finishing up first year, it's been mainly focused on the network. And so recruiting people to join us, people that are trusted messengers in the community and training um, them, listening to what some of their questions are, how we can provide skills and experiences. Actually, Cindy Rogers is on the call. She um, mm -hmm. is one of our network members that we've been working with. Um, and she got us connected to give this presentation today. So thanks, Cindy. Um, and so we're hoping in the second year now to, to do more publicly facing outward, which again is challenging during a pandemic because we don't really like have these gathering places of the community. Um, and so our challenge is um, to maybe help create, creatively create some of those venues and experiences to pull people together to have conversations. Um, any other comments from the team on how climate change in rural PA is going? Yeah, I've been struck by the network and the diversity of the types of people who join the network. I mean, you have your like the people you expect to see. It's like the land conservancy organizations, um, watershed groups, um, educators, a lot of that stuff, parks professionals. Um, but we also have really engaged um, artists. Uh, farmers. Um, we just see climate change and we're seeing that people see climate change as something that's impacting their life. Um, you don't necessarily have to be like a tree person, like a tree professional. I used to work in parks and, um, you know, it's like, of course you expect to see a person like me at the climate change table. Um, but we're seeing that there are, the, be the best conversations happen when you get a diverse group of people together um, that kind of talk about what does climate change mean in my life to me, to what I care about, um, and kind of work on crossing boundaries is something we talk a lot about, um, just like different perspectives and trying to find like, what is that middle ground? Where do we agree? Where might we be different? Um, and kind of trying to negotiate that. We think it gives us a much better, um, we're better ourselves at understanding our own connections and how to communicate that. And we're also better to understand um, people are talking to and just saying like, okay, there's a lot of different ways that people think and feel about climate change, but overwhelmingly there's a lot of people and they wanna talk about it. And when you give them the space to be themselves uh, and have that be okay, um, those conversations can be really productive uh, and really you know, life-changing. And I, I would just add to that, that that diversity that they both talked about is what attracts and keeps people, I think, because when you go to a meeting and you can learn something brand new from somebody else's perspective or something's a little bit unknown or makes you curious, it's like, that's sort of a sweet spot in a, in a place of, like Taji was just saying, generation of new ideas. So it's not like we are training them to do something, but we are more like shaping a process together for how do we have this. And then the other thing that just always blows my mind is how thoughtful and caring people are about the experience someone else is gonna have. That so much of our conversation is how do we make this safe? How do we make this meaningful? How do we make this interesting to other people? And don't we don't wanna shut them down and we want to be hopeful. So that part's been really amazing to watch how, how everybody's grappling with that in both networks. And that certainly echoes a, a lot of our interactions with the task force, you know, just being open with each other and listening to each other's perspectives, concerns, um, and, and respecting each other while also having the common goal of improving our community. Um, are there any groups or partnerships that you are familiar with in Western Pennsylvania that you would recommend the task force get involved with? Um, well, I mentioned that group Reimagine Appalachia. I would imagine that the, the uh, commissioners are interested in you know, how are we going to do a just transition in Homer City, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so they are really on the ground working with um, state officials and with the governor's office to figure out like, hey, like it's not just something on paper, but it's gonna affect people's lives. And we can do this differently than when like steel went international, it went abroad, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, so I, yeah, I would imagine, I would suggest that group um, 
what do others, what do others suggest? I would also, in addition to like seeking out groups that come together around climate change, like CRISP um, can be a really great place. I would also encourage you to just think about the communities you're already involved in, um, faith communities, the Episcopal Church, um, has a huge component of their mission focused on climate change right now, uh, the discussions being had. So thinking about important groups for yourself where you can maybe bring it up. Um, and again, like it's a hard thing to like lob in. It's like you're feeling like you're lobbing something into the pool, um, but there are ways to bring it up. Like if you read a newspaper article that really sticks with you or you saw a video or you came to a webinar, um, mentioning it to people in your social networks um, find out where your community is and like talk about it centered in, in the work you're doing and what brings you together. Um, if you have, you know, classrooms, great place to talk about it. Clubs, great place to talk about it. The dinner table can be awkward, but also like mm -hmm. don't let the awkwardness stop you from talking about it in your own communities. You don't have to go to a specific climate change group to talk about climate change, but Reimagine Appalachia is awesome. They're really cool people. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I, I think that um, certainly having the kind of conversations that you've had where you suggest positive things to do rather than focus on the negative aspects of the issue, things that we should be doing rather than dwelling on the things that we can't really help individually certainly helps. Um, uh, Cindy Rogers uh, says that uh, Reggie is certainly tied with climate change. How do we combat the negativity in those against Reggie um, and talking about fear of uh, you know, job loss. And this is actually a topic that um, we haven't advertised the webinar yet because we don't have all the speakers in place. Um, but this is something that will be discussed in one of our final uh, webinars as a part of our series, which will focus on um, energy policy and its effect on its impact on the workforce. I believe the specific title is um, changes in the in, uh, energy industry impacts on workforce because there, it's more than just policy that is driving these changes. Um, so I don't know if you guys have any comments you'd like to share on that. Um, just another organization that came to mind that we've been connecting with is the Blue Green Alliance. Oh, okay. um, so they, uh, they're national, nationwide, but they do a lot of work here in Western PA. Um, dealing with, uh, they bring a coalition together of environmental organizations and trade unions to build consensus documents that are policy suggestions that both, um, both sides uh, are interested in. So they might have some um, resources or uh, I can recommend a name if you need someone for your, your panel. Um, they also are thinking about Reggie and how it will impact um, communities and how we can use it to step towards um, a more positive, just um, type of uh, community and society. And, and for anyone who's listening, who's interested in these kind of organizations, which, which do exist, this is the first time I've, I've heard of the Blue and Green, but you know, we've, we've heard of uh, Reimagine Appalachia and um, the Blue Green Alliance, thank you. Um, and we, we have, communications with uh, the Just Transition Fund and also uh, Coalfield Development, which is a little bit closer to home. It's based in West Virginia um, and they're, they've been working their way um, out of West Virginia and um, we're, we're hoping to have them as, as a webinar as well. So it's, it's a very interesting topic. Um, finally, uh, are there any re recommendations? You seem, you seem so comfortable in this webinar format. So for any groups that are trying to reach out and do educational webinars, do you have any tips for having these kinds of conversations and, and helping to keep it engaging? I will let Taiji start off because he's the master of a lot of these things. Yeah. Uh, I think kind of like, I think Marianne did a really great job of outlining kind of like behind the curtains what we were thinking um, when we did this. Um, but I think, again, really starting, it, it sounds cliche now, but like starting where people are, um, I think it is an acknowledgement that this is a really complicated issue. And we are so used to thinking about it as an issue that's only about understanding. It's about the scientific side of the problem. Understanding the science, absolutely important to talk about it, to do something about it. Um, but recognizing that it is talking about people's lives and people's lives are complicated. Um, 
and there's a lot of emotion behind it. So taking time to acknowledge um, that we can't only be focusing on where we want people to be, where we want ourselves to be and how other people might be standing in our way. Um, to your point about like the job loss, that is a very real issue for people. Uh, if there were, if people, who isn't worried about a roof over their head, food on their table, particularly in COVID time, particularly with climate change, it's very real. We know that it impacts, um, that we can't expect anybody to be worrying about an environmental or a scientific problem uh, when we have these things. So, so for me, um, taking time to understand what do people need in their lives and how can we use this climate change as an opportunity uh, to rethink what a green job is, what a good job is. A good job absolutely needs to put food on your table, um, put a roof over your head, and hopefully give you enough money to do things that you enjoy to do also, not just survive. Um, and so really thinking about how can we frame this as providing better opportunities that still give people all the things they need to live, um, but kind of reimagine, okay, how can we, how can we really take into account why are people maybe, you know, scared? of the transition. Well, it's because it's about their job. It's about their culture. It's about their town. It's very, very real. Um, and so if we stop thinking about people as like problems to be solved um, and just like, who can we work with? <laughs> what do you need? We probably need the same things. Uh, folks working in the energy industry need to be healthy and safe. Me in Pittsburgh, yeah, air quality is something I am very worried about. I know asthma rates, heart disease rates are high in Pittsburgh. We have some of the worst air quality in the country. That's why I care. That's why I'm like, I'm gonna, this this matters to me. Um, but it's, it's coming from a similar area. So the more that we can kind of leave space to acknowledge emotions and then slow the conversation down, really dig into the nuance um, like we did today. And rather than just like glossing over things, I think like taking the time to talk and listen um, and listening is probably harder. That, and I would just say on top of all those things that Taiji just said is we constantly have to remind ourselves to reverse the narrative, like start with, oh wait, oh no, that's right. We have to start with what people are thinking about. We have to, you know, and then we say, oh, we'll start our, our, we begin our outline and we start in the normal way. And then we go, oh no, wait, got to flip it. Got to take something out that we thought was important and remember what we really believe is important. That's where the DNA is helpful. Like just to remind ourselves, oh, are we talking about systems yet? Oh, are we talking about relevance? Are we talking about, is there a place for emotion here? Okay. So maybe giving yourself a tickler list of things you wanna make sure, all the stuff that you know is working with your network, right? You know that it's important for people to make connections to each other. You know it's important to have, like Taji just said, the time to talk about it. So don't allow other formats to take that time away from you or, or your desire to teach everything at once, you know, like pick something and just, really explore that thing. And we still struggle with that. <laughs> oh, thank you, that's all excellent. Oh, go ahead, Bonnie. I was just gonna add like for Zoom specifically, some of the things we found is like changing it up every 20 minutes. Like people don't want one face talking at them for like an hour. So that is really cool. Having ways for people to interact. We use Google Jamboards, we use polls, we use the chat a lot. And we're working with, you know, um, mainly like middle-aged folks. And so you might at first be like, oh, they're not going to be able to use Jamboards. And they've come along with us using all of these cool interactive things. Um, so things like that are some of the, some of the tricks, I don't know, that help us with Zoom. Those are all excellent tips and advice. And, you know, uh, thank you, Tachi. I think that you, you, you hit the nail right on the head. Uh, this has been an excellent webinar and we're so glad that we got to have you guys today. Are there any final questions from the audience before we close out? Give it a few seconds in case someone wants to type. Thank you for having us as part of your, your series, your summit, Molly. Yeah, and we're, we're thrilled to have had you. Thank you so much. This was great. Just kind of following up with the, the logistics of Zoom. Don't let, Bonnie kind of said it already, don't let it be a barrier to having interactive conversations. Use the polls that are available. Use the chat feature. You know, we did that, that waterfall. We asked you some questions. We asked you to think about which owl are you when we say the words climate change. We gave you a space to think about your personal bird story. And that's a way that we make things crispy. We make it personal. We make it relatable. And so all of the things that 
not all of the things that we would do. You can't sit across the table and have a cup of coffee, but you can still have a conversation with your audience and that is key. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Um, and remember, uh, you can find more information at our website, uh, which is uh, sustainableindianacounty.org. Uh, go to the Summit for Webinar Series tab, and it'll take you from there. And uh, stick around to fill out our survey if you can, if you don't mind to do so. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.